for that's what He wants of us. Our journey over the last weeks and months and different time periods has been learning and understanding. I'm bringing some snacks because it's a pretty long message today. So, uh, but uh, I, uh, can y'all see that? I just want you to have to look at that. It's really what I want you to have to do. Uh, but on a journey to just learn what it is that we believe, and uh, that's perfect. Can you, just for a while, can you leave that right there? Right in on those Chips Ahoy cookies. What we believe and why we believe it, what difference it should make in our lives, the things that those, those things that we believe. If I believe that God is the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible is the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If I believe that His Word is the living Word of God that gives direction for my every decision that I make, if I believe that God is a personal God that is active and involved in my daily life and cares about my daily life, that changes everything. If I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father but by Him, it changes the way I live. Or at least it should. It should be evident. In, in what I practice, in what I do, that my life should be a life that worships God. And that's going to be expressed in different ways. We see that every Sunday in our worship services. That different folks express that worship in different ways. And, and we do that. We will, we will study His Word. We will, we will get together and be with other believers in Christ. We will be the church. And that means more than just coming and gathering within a building that we call our church building. We are the church. And that'll mean getting outside the walls of our church and letting folks see Christ in us. We will practice those things. We will totally surrender. We sang a song and there was a phrase in there, I surrender. If, if I believe what I believe about this Bible to be true and the things about God to be in it, it's going to affect the way I live and I will surrender my ways to His ways. And as I do that, I will become more like the one that created me. And our life goal. Our purpose in life, one of the things that should motivate us to do what we do is to be like Jesus. We want to be a reflection of Him for the world to see, and that ought to be ever-changing in our lives. And so right now we're on this journey of unpacking and looking at some virtues, some characteristics that need to be evident in our life. And we've looked at this thing called love. We've looked at joy and peace, and hope. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I introduced and, and gave us a little bit of insight into this thing called self-control. And, um, and that's the reason for my pictures today. Um, if you know me well at all, you know that I love sports, and specifically that I love golf, but you also know that I have a sweet tooth. And that one of the things that I enjoy in life is to have dessert first. I mean, life's too short, right? So you eat dessert first. And you guys can fight your way through the fellowship line. When we have a meal, you'll find me at the dessert line, you know? I'm the guy that always volunteers to get the desserts out because you get to lick the knives and the serving spatulas and between slices. Oh, wait. <laughs> That's at home. And uh, only when company's coming over. But we do have something, right, that's our kryptonite, if you will. Something in our lives that we just get weak when we're around that. And, and it may not be for you chocolate chip cookies, or really for me it's about any kind of cookie, it's any kind of cake, it's, any, it's anything along those lines. I, I even like my sweet tea. I mean, it's just the sweeter the better, you know, in all of that. For some of us, it's... Um, ice cream would be your kryptonite and then you get to pick your flavor right and if you're really an ice cream person it's just ice cream that's kind of where my dad falls into that mix it doesn't matter what kind just so it's ice cream and he's invited and and yet maybe it's you just love I know that my wife loves the burn of the Dr. Pepper you know of just that taking that drink of a Dr. Pepper and just, oh it just gets her you know she just loves that and uh, I'm not supposed to make her laugh, but I just did. Um, and, uh, and so just lots of different things in the area of, of food for us. 
For some people, food is not your kryptonite. We were at Falls Creek, uh, and I got to help with cooking and all that kind of stuff, and several folks there were striving to watch what we ate and what we, in, you know, how much we intake, took, whatever the right way to say that word is, and uh, how much we ate and different things, and Shane Buchanan was one of the guys that was attempting to do that, and man, we went all week long, and we get to Friday, and he's passed up this kind of dessert, and he's passed up this, and all this different food, and he's gone and, and had chicken when everybody else was having some other good meat, and all that kind of stuff, I like chicken too, but anyway, uh, we get to the last meal, and it's chicken breast, and it's all of this, and I'm frying okra, I'm standing at the stove, and I'm frying okra, and Shane walks in and says, oh, you found my kryptonite. And, and so, I don't know what it is for you, but there's something. There's something that you struggle with that is like unto this for me. I mean, if I had a bag of Lay's potato chips up here, for some of you that would be it, because you just, you bought into their logo, you know, or their motto, you can't eat just one. And that's the way I am with cookies. I mean, one's good enough, three's better. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, or if it's cheese balls for the nursery kids, if this, that's where these are going when this is over, is into the nursery for the kids. But something, something gets you. And for some of us, it's not food. For some of us, it's our spending. Do you know the average individual spends a dollar thirty-three for every dollar that they make? There are folks that have a challenge self-control when it comes to spending it doesn't matter I might mention Walmart I might mention Costco or Sam's or I might mention the dollar store it, it doesn't matter I don't know what your kryptonite store is but some of you have a kryptonite store or you have an object I, I don't want to talk about ladies shoes but it could be shoes right I mean <laughs> it, it could be anything you something around the area you just dread getting the mail because you know there's going to be bills in there and one of those bills is going to be that credit card that you choose to use to indulge yourself for your lack of self-control only to feel regret when you open that bill and realize I can't pay it off and there's a world of folks that are struggling because your kryptonite may not be food but your kryptonite may be your spending and you put yourself in a bind to where you can't honor and glorify God the way He designed you to because you have become constricted in the area of your finances. For some of us, it's not that. For some of us, it's our, it's our anger. It doesn't take much for you to fly off the handle. It just doesn't take a whole lot. We've had some jokes in our house the last couple of weeks where we've all caught each of us just kind of on, a, on an edge of turning to somebody and, and saying something, and it sounds like we're just mad, and that we're just, just and, it, and we're really not. We're just kind of caught up in a moment right there. But there are some folks that a word or a situation or something just, it triggers you, and you, you go off the handle. That's your kryptonite, something along that line. For some of us, it's, it's this little thing that is housed inside this these lips it's about yay wide you know and about so just depending on how long our kryptonite is our talking and it's that desire just to share whatever it is that we hear whether or not we know it's true or not and whether or not we know the and we we, we say well I didn't I didn't really say anything I just picked up my phone and You need to understand more than anything today in the world that we live in, the stuff that you print are your words. You can vent on social media all you want to, but it's your words. And you can't take them back. And for many of us, our kryptonite is not a bag of cookies. It's the last, the most juicy story that we just heard. Or it's anything about anybody, and we can't wait to get out there and talk about it. sticking our nose into people's business that's not our business at all. 
I just want us to understand that whether we can, we can make light of self-control with cookies and chips and ice cream, or we can get serious about self-control and realize that it could be about our spending and about our attitudes and about our words and our actions. That was the Lord's amen right there. <laughs> Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Titus. All right? If you have a little trouble finding Titus, just uh, keep looking. It's on page 916 in my Bible. Um, Titus comes right after First and Second Timothy. You see, you may struggle with those areas, or it may even get really serious and and you may, you may have some kind of a struggle with, with an addiction beyond food. You may struggle with what you look at. You may struggle with the pictures and the things that you choose to let your eyes and your mind think about. Pornography is one of the biggest industries in our... And I would, I would be foolish to say that in the crowd of our size that there's not a man and a woman, a boy and a girl that's not struggling with the area of self-control in what you view and what you look at. Some of us, it's what we put in our body beyond the cookies, and I think cookies to an extreme can be harmful to my health. I understand that. I am cutting back. There's only two gone out of there, and I didn't eat them. It was a full deal when I brought it to the church a few days ago, and now it's not. But, um, but you can put things into your body that are harmful. You can be addicted to various types of things. So it's a real serious issue, and I think God takes it seriously. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and following, he talks to us about the fruit of the Spirit, and he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. God includes that in something that He wants to be evident in our life, the ability for us to control our lives. And then He goes on in many different ways throughout Scripture saying, hey, if you need to tame your tongue, guess what? You can't. You want to control your thoughts? You can't. Paul says, I, I find myself doing the exact things that I don't want to do. I, I, I hate those things, but I find myself being drawn to them. I don't want to eat all those cookies! And it may not be cookies for you. God, I don't want to look at that stuff anymore. I don't want to talk about this any longer. I don't want to get angry. You understand, it could be whatever, but we struggle with this area of self-control. And what ultimately comes to us from the Scripture is, in order to be self-controlled, I must surrender. I must really give up Control. I must let God control my life. Self-control is really God. To find ways in our lives that we would allow God to have control of ourselves, that we would yield everything to us. I stood in line yesterday. Vicki needed some um, gauze and tape and stuff to, to redo and repackage up her, her um, wound from her surgery and everything. And so I went to Dollar General and was buying a few things, and I stood there in the line... And I look over, and right there at the line, you know, they've got this stuff called candy. And it's just right there. And then they have this, this idea that if they say it's two for something, that it'll get people like me, you know. One is this much, but two of them is only this much. And so I actually find myself picking up two, two rolls of Mentos. Oh, aren't those good? You know? And I pick them up and I hold them in my hand, only to sit there and say... I really don't need these. A dollar is not that much. I mean, I can afford the dollar. But I really don't need those because I am trying. Like, I'm trying. And I put them back. A small victory. And that's what we need to look for in our lives, are small victories in this area of giving God control of our life. And so let me, let me read this passage from Titus. Paul is writing here, and, and he shares something. I just want to begin reading in, verse, in chapter 2, the first few verses, because I think it shows us that self-control is for all of us. 
But as for you, teach what, a, what accords with sound doctrine. Older men, be sober-minded, diligent, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Do you see it? The older men and women, the younger women and men, all of them are encouraged and urged to be self-controlled in the midst of all of that. A lady that's to teach someone to be self-controlled can't teach them unless they're striving to be self-controlled themselves. We can't do that. All throughout Scripture we will see you can find that God desires for us to follow His commands, to follow His calls. He calls us to this Christ-likeness. And one of those virtues is to offer Him self-control, to give control of our lives back to him continue he says show yourselves in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us and then drop down to verse 11 for the grace of god has appeared bringing salvation for all people it teaches us to say no to un ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. What's the blessed hope? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for Himself a people that are His very own eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach encourage and rebuke with all authority and don't let anyone despise you i want you to catch verse 11 it says for the grace of god has appeared that offers salvation to all people and it teaches us what teaches us the grace of god what is, what is that grace? It's God's love for us that we haven't earned. Grace is, is receiving something that we haven't earned. Grace, mercy, that picture of what we don't deserve. It's, it's one of the ways that God shows us that He loves us even though we don't deserve it. When He offers us His grace. And He offered this grace, and this grace brings or offers Salvation. That's what the Scripture there says. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The grace of God is a gift, and that brings salvation, God's gift to us. And even after receiving that gift of salvation and that offer of salvation that He's brought to us, God's not done with us. We are not saved just to be saved and, and sitting. We're not saved just to be saved so that we can have a home in heaven. That's, that's one of the fringe benefits that comes with the salvation. That's the joy that comes with that salvation. But we are saved to serve. We are saved to, to, to let people see Him in us. His grace not only saves us, Titus is being taught here. The grace of God's appeared, bringing salvation for all people, teaching them or showing them to renounce ungodliness, to say no to ungodliness. The grace of God's not finished in you once He saved you. He is also, His grace is there to change us. And His grace changes us in that it changes my attitude. Oh, I think that's important because when I get mad and I know I'm not supposed to get mad, I'm not offering and, and demonstrating self-control, so I need to let God have control of that and God changes my attitude. So that even though you do something that I don't like and even though you do something that you shouldn't do or even though I do something I shouldn't do, I don't get instantly angry. I bring that attitude and that, that action under God's control. God's grace changes me. It affects my attitudes. It affects my 
appetite so that I can put the Mentos back or so that I can push the second piece of cake away. It, it, it can even change the appetites that deal with what I look at. See, I'm trying to be careful, but I want you to understand it's serious business. Some of us have appetites that are sensual and selfish and all of that in nature. And yet God's grace is there to help change us so that we won't give in to our own indulgences, but we'll let God have control. My ambitions and my actions, God's grace is at work in my life for what purpose? To make us more like Jesus. And so His grace works on us. It teaches us to say no, the scripture says. Teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires and all of those things. God's grace is there to help us live a self-controlled life. Why? Because God's grace is what's working and it's really God controlling what I think, what I say, what I eat, where I go, what I do, letting Him control everything. It's tied to the practice that we looked at months ago, total surrender. And, and that desire to just surrender everything. And I can't do it on my own. But God's grace working on me and in me and through me. Where I might have trouble saying no to the cookie. <laughs> or maybe something a little more dangerous than a cookie. The grace of God teaches me and it teaches you to say no. To say no to those things and to demonstrate God control in my life. So you can't have control over the areas of your life that you struggle with. But maybe the challenge that we need to, to take this morning is that we need to give God's grace room to move in our life. I've got to pick up the cookie. Take a moment and put it down. I've got to begin to turn to look to that computer screen and stop before I get there. I've got to take a moment and give God's grace an opportunity to work, to let the God that's in me, that resides in here, that lives within me, give Him a chance. His Holy Spirit to work in my life, to help me know I don't need to do that. I need to take a breath and count to whatever number you need to count to before you say what you know you shouldn't say. You need to read what you've just typed before you hit post. And that's not to check it for spell checking to make sure that it corrected everything. That's probably not a bad idea either. But many times we type something and if we'll take just a moment to let the grace of God work in our life, we'll delete that before we ever push sin. But when we're acting in our control, we'll hit sin before we ever read it because we don't really care at that moment how it's received by the people out there that are going to read it. We're just ready to get something off of our chest and make our point. I'm just... Self-control, do you understand? We struggle. But we don't struggle alone. God is there to help us. Anytime God in His Word tells us there's something He wants us to have or to do in our lives, He gives us the help to make it happen. Read through His Word. I mean, examples, good examples and bad examples, all the way through of people that, that, that dealt with this issue of self-control. You can turn to Judges chapter 16 and read about Samson. And how Samson struggled with his area and how he gave in. You could turn to Genesis and read about this fellow by the name of Joseph. Joseph gives you a very good example and picture from an Old Testament story of someone that didn't give in to the self-control side of things, of doing what he probably, in our minds, rightfully could have done because of how he'd been treated. But he didn't. 
You could turn to Luke chapter 15 and read the story of the prodigal son, the loving father, and you would see a picture of a way not to practice self-control. You could read through the pages of the New Testament, specifically the Gospels, and you could see the example of your Savior, Jesus Christ, and how He showed us how to treat women, how He showed us how to respect one another, how He showed us how to act in every circumstance and situation that we'll face, and gave us direction for that. His Word gives us direction as to how to handle and have self-control. How to let God have control of your life. Let me give you three words and I'm finished. It'll take me longer than three words to say three words, but you already know that. This, this thought as well. Self-control is when you're able to do what you intend to do and resist what you don't want to do. It's what Paul struggled with. When you're able to do what you intend to do and resist what you don't want to do, but here's discipline to stop doing things we shouldn't, but it's also the discipline to do the things that we know we should and act in the proper way. And God's Word will help you do both. So here's your three words. Flee. Resist. And run. Flee. Flee from all immorality, all the evil desires. Flee from anything that goes against God's design for your life. How do I know that? I read the book. No, not Reader's Digest, not National Geographic, not People Magazine. You read the good book, the Holy Word of God. And you let the Spirit of God guide you. You let the Word of God direct you. And you allow the people of God to encourage you. That's what I shared with you two weeks ago. To develop this self-control. We flee from all immorality. We flee and we run from any idolatry. Anything that we allow to take God's place in our life, we get rid of it. We flee from it. We flee from the false teachers, from the bad practices. Anything that could draw us away from the Lord. Go read what Paul wrote to the church in, at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Read what he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and 3. All of those and many other places, he tells us, flee, 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 flee from these things. Here's the deal. You can't overcome self-control if you continue to hang out with the things that give you trouble. I can't sit here and look in my pantry and stare at all of the sweet stuff and just... If I expect to not struggle with it and not give in to it. If I'm struggling with the area of the things that I look and put into my mind, I can't sit in front of the computer screen by myself. I can't watch television programs. Huh, that's a whole other issue, isn't it? There are things that I have to I can't put myself around. I gotta flee those things. Flee from the immorality. Free, flee from the idolatry, anything that might take the place of God. Get away from the false teachings and the and the bad practices and the evil desires, all of that stuff. Resist. Resist the enemy. You need to understand the devil's real and he is seeking to take you down. But you must not forget that as a child of God, the victory is yours. You can overcome, not in your own strength, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can gain control of my life with Christ's help. I give God control. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You need to flee some things. You need to push some things away that, that you come in contact with, that you circle yourselves around, but you need to resist the things that come at you. And the devil will come at you in all of those forms and a hundred others. 1 Peter chapter 5 says, Be alert and sober-minded. Sober is another word used for our idea of self-control in Scripture as well. So be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, 
prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The next word in Scripture is resist him and stand firm in the faith. Resist the enemy. He is going to come at you. You're going to think he's throwing cookies at you if cookies is your kryptonite. You're going to think he's throwing every kind of image and picture at you if that's what you struggle with. He's going to put every kind of person in your pathway that just makes your skin cringe and the hair stand up on the back of your neck and the people that just irritate you if that's your kryptonite, that's who he's going to throw your way. Resist his efforts. Run from that stuff and to him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Who, for what was getting ready to come his way, he, he endured the cross you and made his grace available for your life flee resist run run from sin run from temptation get thee behind me cookies I don't need you and in all seriousness that's what you need to do with the areas of your life that you struggle having control over. Get thee behind me. I don't need you. I don't want you. I want my life to reflect Jesus Christ. I want to be more like Him. And so I have to flee, resist, and run. Run to the Lord. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we don't run just for the sake of running. We have purpose and intent and determination behind us. We train, we get ready for this because we want to run as one that's going to win the race. We're running towards a finish line. We're running to that line I've drawn over there months ago. I want to be like Jesus. And in order for that to happen, I must exhibit self-control in my life. And I have the power through Christ to do just that. Well, here's a confession of a chocolate chip cookie addict. I just can't let it go, can I? Here's the confession from the addict. I tell you what, when I see a chocolate chip cookie, I just can't eat one. I got to eat at least a dozen of them or maybe the whole box. I don't have any self-control I am the chocolate chip cookie monster addict. Woe is me, I am hopelessly cookieified. The counselor's response, listen. Well, come on. You're just taking yourself right into that chocolate chip cookie pit. You do have self-control, and you need to start looking at those cookies and saying, if I want to eat those cookies, I'll eat them. And if I don't, I won't. Come on. Talk to that box or that plate full of cookies. Tell them you're a born-again follower of Christ and the Holy Spirit lives within you and that you have the power of the universe on the inside of you and you don't have to. You can overcome. How do you expect to grow in self-control, the counselor says, if you can't even defeat a chocolate chip cookie? Yeah, we can laugh a little bit about my example. But you need to realize, if you're sitting here this morning and you're a child of the one true king, and you've trusted him as Savior and Lord, you have the power within you to exhibit self-control, parentheses, God control in your life. Christ's power is available to you. His word shows us how. Flee. Flee from it. Run to Him. <laughs> and just acknowledge Him for who He is. So I guess maybe the question for you is, will you? 
Will you let Christ's power work through you so that you could begin this afternoon, tomorrow, the next day, and for the rest of your life exhibiting and showing more self-control each and every day. Taking more of the character of Christ on in your life. And if you're here and you're a Christian, you can do that. Not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. So I ask you, will you? But if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord, you don't have anything inside of you to help you. But you can. You could today choose to ask Christ to forgive you of your sin. You could, you could just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flee from that stuff. I'm going I'm gonna to run to your arms. Come running to Him today. And I promise you, He'll be just like the loving father or the prodigal son of Luke chapter 15. He will meet you on your way to Him. And He will forgive you of all that you've done and He will give you the grace to make it through whatever you're going to face. He will help you to exhibit love, joy, peace, hope, self-control, and the rest in your life. So my question to you is, will you trust Him today? Why don't you stand to your feet? Father, this morning, we thank You for this time together, and I pray that Your message would come to life in us. That, Father, we would exhibit for You a life of self-control, when we would begin by just giving you control of our lives, guide my eyes, my mind, my words, my actions, my ears, all of that stuff, Father, that I might honor you with my life. Father, for that person that's here that's never trusted you as Savior and Lord, I pray today, today would be their day that they would become a part of the family of God draw them to you today in Jesus name I pray use these moments